A new law that proponents say will make voting more accessible in Minnesota has been signed into law. It's more important than ever that we shore up this democracy. We shore it up for the people of Minnesota. We shore it up in this country. We show the rest of the world. The world's oldest and strongest democracy is strong. Minnesota is doing our part by making it stronger today. And this piece of legislation is just the exact type of things that Minnesotans asked us to do. I'm proud to say that Minnesota's ballots will now be offered in additional languages. I'm proud to have fair and lawful campaigns. And I'm excited to see our young people engaged in the democratic process. This bill is a historic victory, but it is not a partisan victory. Red states, blue states, and purple states have adopted the measures that we're talking about today. And that's because these reforms are nonpartisan in origin and nonpartisan in effect. It is a generational moment where we have a choice to make. What we've seen over the last couple of years and the last couple of months is states across the country making a choice. We are making a choice for a thriving, multiracial, multigenerational, multiracial, gender-inclusive democracy. As we are building the best state, that North Star state, in many spaces and in many ways, this is the work that comes before that. This is the necessary work that helps us to build that, to be sure that every voice can be heard, that we are making it easier for Minnesotans to vote, not harder. Senator Liz Bolden is the Senate sponsor of the measure, and she joins me now. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So first, congratulations on getting this bill across the finish line, and also welcome to the Senate. This is our first interview. Generally, what's important from your perspective for people to know about this new law? So this is a, a package of, of provisions that really are geared to make voting easier, to put Minnesotans' voices at the center. Uh, we'll get into the details, but includes things like automatic voter registration, pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, um, a number of things really aimed at, at Minnesotans and making voting easier for them. So you mentioned uh, automatic voter registration. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, which known around here is the NCSL. 22 states and the District of Columbia have enacted automatic voter registration. So Minnesota is now the 23rd state to do this. Will automatic voter registration just happen at the Department of Motor Vehicles or does it happen with interaction with multiple state agencies? Yeah, it will start uh, with just uh, renewing driver's licenses um, with the potential to expand to other agencies. And I'll just say, as you, as you mentioned, you know, other states have been doing this and red states, blue states, purple states. This isn't about, uh, this isn't a partisan provision. It really is nonpartisan aimed at, at helping folks to vote. And it's called automatic voter registration, but they're really, it's sort of a misnomer because behind this, it's, it's, uh, seamless for voters. Uh, behind the scenes, there's nothing really automatic about it. The, the same checks and balances go into place um, when folks interact with an agency and are providing the information necessary to know if they are eligible to vote. So, you know, proving that they are a citizen and that they are who they say they are and they live where they say they live and that they're over 18, um, they are, are placed, they're registered to vote. And so um, seamless for the voter, but still all the same processes behind the scenes. And, and uh, as I said, we'll, we'll start with uh, driver's licenses, uh, but has the potential as time moves on and, and systems are, are built and we need to get permission from the federal government, um, it, it may um, move on to other agencies as well. And if there are individuals out there who do not wish to be registered to vote, do they have the option to opt out? They do. So um, when that occurs, uh, uh, when folks are, have provided the information through interaction with the government agency and they are, are on the, um, in the queue to be registered and those checks are happening, they will receive a postcard or a letter in the mail saying that you've been, you know, provide this information, you've been registered to vote, let us know if you don't want to be registered. And they can mail that back and say, nope, don't want to be registered. Um, it gives a window of 20 days for, as a prompt to, you know, let us know. But if people go beyond that 20 days at any time, which is current now, at any time, if people are registered and wish to not be registered, they can request to not be registered and that is honored. Okay, uh, more than a dozen states allow people to begin pre-registering to vote at the age of 16, according to a nonpartisan website that I found called Headcount. Um, I have an almost 16 year old at home. So what is your message to him and other 16 and 17 year olds out there about why they should pre-register to vote? 
I would say it's a great way to get involved and to start being engaged in the system because your voice matters. Um, we have found through other states, as you mentioned, who have done this, when um, you know young folks get pre-registered, it really puts them on a path to being lifelong voters, which is what we want, right? We want everyone's voice to be included. And so this is a way to get them involved in the process and to make them feel um, like they are engaged and, and, and um, involved and, and able to be, uh, you know, have that voice, which is exactly what we want. And maybe start tracking the news. Absolutely. <laughs> they feel like they have a stake in what's happening. Uh, no excuses. Absentee voting was a big deal in 2014. Then voting by absentee ballot became crucial during the pandemic. Now, because of this law, Minnesotans will be able to opt in to a permanent absentee voter list. So who is most likely to benefit from this option? Yeah, I will say this would be open to anyone who wishes to do so, and it really puts into place uh, something which many Minnesotans thought was happening before. They, they um, had requested a, an absentee ballot and, and thought they got on a list, but previously, right now, today, what happens is what they get is an application for a ballot, not an actual ballot. And so um, it was causing confusion with Minnesotans, honestly. So this streamlines that process for people who say, I want to vote uh, you know, absentee every time. Um, they will get that ballot. And again, all of the same checks and balances occur in the background, but you know, this uh, especially impacts who we've heard from is folks with disabilities, um, folks who are older and, and have more mo mobility issues. Uh, you know, uh, it also you know, could impact anyone because as anyone could take advantage of this, but it's... I, so I love to go vote on voting day. It's just part of a thing that I love. But let's say I just don't want to be bothered, but I still want to vote. I could get on this list and then it, the ballot would always come to me. And if I decided, no, I still want to go on voting on, on election day, I still could. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, the state demographer will now have a role going forward in determining the three most commonly spoken non-English languages in each census tract. So what information will now be provided to voter eligible citizens for whom English is a second language? So I'm really proud of this provision with the intention of getting information to folks in a language that is most comfortable for them. And this is something that Minnesota has a long tradition of. Um, going back uh, for decades and decades, we have provided information in other languages. Those, what those languages are has changed over, the, over time, and that's why it's geared at um, you know, what are the top three languages. But it is meant for in those areas where there's a higher population of folks who, who speak you know, English is not their native language, they will be able to pro be provided written materials in their own language, um, and if there's an even higher percentage, um, there will be an interpreter um, available at polling places in, in those languages that are meaningful to them. Because again, we, we want people to have the information they need to be able to cast their vote and feel comfortable doing so. And it's true that, that people can have functional English skills, but still when it comes to voting and, and understanding rules and, and complexities, your native tongue would be more beneficial. Absolutely. When, it, when we're talking about sort of technical pieces or that just that conversational uh, piece is different than sort of the details and mechanics of, of voting, which, you know, again, we, we want to be sure people are under, clearly understanding and have all the information they need. In a statement, you said that this bill will, quote, shine a light on secret spending in politics. People talk about dark money in politics. Uh, it appears that there is general suspicion among the public about where some negative ads originate, you know, in election season. How does the new law increase transparency for voters? This is one of the provisions that I have heard the most about from Minnesotans because that dark money spending is the most unpopular with Minnesotans. We should know who is spending money in our elections and who is trying to influence our vote. And so the provision in this bill uh, limits that. It's two main things. One, it, and I won't get into the weeds of the wonkiness, but um, uh, there are some rules about disclosure. It brings us up to the federal guidelines around disclosure of having to say who is spending this money so Minnesotans can know who's trying to influence my vote. Um, and the second piece is provisions around limiting the spending of foreign influenced corporations in our elections. Because again, um, you know, Minnesotans don't want foreign voices, foreign influence in our elections. And so um, really limiting that. For, for corporations, it's not, this isn't about people, it's about corporations. Uh, and, you know, Citizens United has really um, uh, caused issues and problems with that and limited what we are you know, able to uh, regulate, but we can regulate foreign influence corporations in our elections, and so that's the that's same of this bill. And one more question. Uh, voter intimidation, harassment, and deceptive practices are spelled out 
in the law and violator, violators can be charged with a gross misdemeanor. What types of behavior is this law going to try to stop? So again, we want Minnesotans to be safe and comfortable as they're casting their vote. And you know, we're seeing a trend across the country of disinformation, misinformation, and people, um, often election workers, not feeling safe um, in, in doing the really important work to help, you know, to be sure that everybody can vote. And so this bill includes things like uh, the disinformation piece of, of if there's an ad that says, oh, you know, be sure you vote on November 9th, but election day is November 8th, that's not okay. And so. Uh, putting some regulations and, and um, limits into, you know, making sure that people can safely cast their vote. Senator Liz Bolden, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.